two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm trying to show you that I can actually count. Okay. Okay. I assume you're Lee. Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's nice to meet you. I, you've probably spoken here before, but not that we ever really got to connect if I was around.
everyone, and welcome to Exeter Bible Fellowship Church. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for our worship service. If this is your first time visiting with us today, we would invite you to lean forward and pull out the card that's in the pocket in the seat in front of you. If you scan one of the QR codes on that card, it will take you to our online visitor connection form. If you could just take a moment to fill out the information on that form, it just lets us know that you are here today and gives us a little bit of information about you. Also, please make sure to stop by our welcome desk in the main lobby before you leave today. Let the ladies there know that today is your first time visiting with us and they would love to send you home with a special gift just to say thanks for being with us today. This is an announcement for all of our men. We are planning on putting on a men's fellowship retreat in August, specifically hosted at French Creek here in Birdsboro. One thing that we're really hoping is that this is just an opportunity for men who are interested can stay overnight at French Creek by camping, or it's close enough in town that if you're interested in just attending and then going back home to sleep at night, and be with your families, that is also an option. The cost for this retreat is $20 and that covers your food as well as the camping if you're interested in staying overnight. But the dates for this are August 24th and 25th and we wanna make sure that you get yourselves registered before we get too far into August. Just make sure that we can plan accordingly. But $20 gets you registered, so make sure that you speak with either Nate Arndt or Andrew Eichelberger if you're interested in getting signed up and registered. For a couple weeks now, we've been announcing a new service opportunity that is coming up in the end of July. There is a group of brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing a bike tour that will be coming through our area on Wednesday, July 31st. They had asked if they could spend the night at our church on the evening of July 31st, and we said that they could. We also said that we would provide them with dinner on Wednesday night, as well as breakfast on Thursday morning, August 1st, before they head out on the next leg of their trip. If you are interested in helping with either of those meals, whether you just want to donate food or you want to come and actually help us prepare and serve the food, we would certainly appreciate any volunteers that would be willing to do that. You can see today's e-bulletin for more information as well as the church's contact information if you would like to let us know that you'd be interested in helping. As Jen mentioned, we have that bike tour that will be coming through our church here at the end of July, the first day of August as well. One thing we wanted to do is put on a special little event that we could have some fellowship as well as even have some of the members of that bike tour participate in an open mic night. If you are interested, anybody from our church is also welcome to participate. I just need to know that I need to put you on the list and make sure that I have things prepared for whoever will be putting on a type of performance. This could be music or jokes or some other type of presentation or talent if you want to, but let me know either way. You can email me at ldavis at exeterbfc.org or you can speak with me in person to let me know you plan on attending. This will be the evening of July 31st, Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Ladies, our Connections event for July is coming up this Saturday, July 20th at 10 a.m. and it will be at the home of Becky and Jordan Demko. The event will be a baby shower for some of our local pregnancy centers. You can see all the details about it in this week's e-bulletin. If you plan on coming and haven't already, please sign up either in the lobby today on the paper sheet or you can sign up in today's e-bulletin online. One side note, there are parking limitations at the Demco's home, so please try to coordinate with others who plan to come to this event so that you can plan to carpool if at all possible. That's everything that we have to announce for this morning, but there's always a lot more going on, so make sure you check out the e-bulletin to get more information, to find the registration links, as well as some further things that happen on a week-to-week -week basis here at Exeter BFC. One thing I wanna make you aware of is we will be having our next annual kayaking float trip down the Schuylkill River in August on the 18th. So if you are interested in attending that, I just wanna make sure that you put that date on your calendars because it's gonna be Sunday afternoon around two o'clock or so when we finally decide to put in the water. There will be more information for that as well as registration opening up soon. So just wanted to put it on your radar. Otherwise, check out the e-bulletin at exeterbfc.org slash bulletins. And don't forget about our special summer hours that are going on right now, which you can find that info in the e-bulletin. Before we get started with our worship portion of service, let's go ahead and stand and greet our neighbors.
Good morning, everyone. Missed you all last Sunday, but it's good to be back. As we uh, begin with worship this morning, we're going to do a song that we learned two Sundays ago, um, but hopefully you remember it. At least the words are pretty easy if you've been around church for any amount of time, as we'll be singing the words to the Lord's Prayer. But uh, let's, let's get our hearts right as we worship this morning and, and remember that uh, as we sing this song, especially declaring in the bridge that it's yours, it's all his um, that we desire to see, all glory and honor and praise to our heavenly Father um, that his kingdom would come here on earth and that we're called to be a part of that. So let's worship together this morning. worship, declaring those things, that we would see him move. Let's remind ourselves with this next song that his love never fails. Nothing, neither height nor depth, nor sin or anything that we can conjure here on earth can separate us from our heavenly father. 
Let's sing this song together. Let's start with the verse. Nothing can separate. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. Oh, I know I still make mistakes. I know I still make mistakes. You have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. It never fails. I'm gonna declare this. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. Maybe pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know. The wind is strong, the water's deep. The wind is strong and the water's deep. But I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. Well, the chasm is far too wide. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails, it never fails. Back to the chorus, you stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning.
and you may be seated as we move into our time of morning prayer and offering. As the ushers come forward, let's bow our heads in prayer. God, we thank you this morning that we can gather here in an environment that is entirely dedicated to you. And um, God, as we sing these songs, whether they're prayers from us as individuals to your heart, God, um, that they're inward cries of our desire to see you glorified and honored or as a, as a whole to see you change this world. Father, I pray that it is exactly what is truly in our hearts and not just words that we sing, that we would not be seeking what we can gain from you, God, for our own pleasure, but ultimately that we can be wholeheartedly devoted to you to bring you pleasure, God, that we can glorify and honor your name in a way that um, transforms the world around us for your honor. God, we just thank you that we're called to that no matter how difficult it is, how frustrating it can be to try to live up to that. But ultimately, we thank you for Jesus Christ and that sacrifice to, to cover all things and to make all things new. God, um, as we continue with our service this morning, whether it's through worship or your word um, or even the giving of our tithes and offerings, I pray that it would be more opportunities for us to surrender. And whatever that looks like, because that's different for each individual here, Father, but um, we also know that there's needs in this congregation for congregants who aren't able to be with us here physically, Father, or even those who may be traveling because of holidays or other things like that. Um, whether we're in sickness or health, God, we turn to you, and um, you know the needs. You know what's going on um, even more so than we as individuals might know. So, God, we, we just lift up those needs of our congregation. Um, and we pray for the sickness. We pray for the hurt. We pray for the loss. Um, and ultimately, we pray for your comfort and peace amongst those situations. And uh, as we even sang that you work all things together for good, but God, the rest of that is that it's for your glory, not just the thing that we want. That's not good. That is our own selfish desires. So Father, if those things line up with your heart, we praise you for that. And if they don't, Father, if your good looks different than our concept of it, I pray that you would allow our, our minds and our hearts to have peace and comfort in you being the one who is in control of all things. Father, we continue to worship you, and as we give these tithes and offerings, pray that you use these finances um, for your glory, not about anything that can be done here in this church building, um, God, whether it's physical change or change in our hearts um, and minds, allow us to be used for your glory and for your kingdom. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As those containers are being passed, this is the final Sunday before we fully move back to our, our kids' classes. So we're not going to dismiss the kids yet this week. That's next Sunday. Um, but as those are passed, if you're able, let's stand and sing one more song together as Gwen leads us in um, God with us.
take a quick moment to introduce our guest speaker this morning as Pastor Bill and his family have been able to take a vacation this weekend. Um, so you can be in prayer for them and their travels and their ability to hopefully just rest and enjoy some good quality time as a family away from um, the responsibilities and sometimes stressors that can happen uh, being a pastor at a church. But um, our guest speaker this morning is Richard Taylor, who I've, I know has been here in the past, maybe not recently in the last couple of years, but uh, he is uh, involved in the Bible Fellowship. I know he'll give you a little bit more uh, of an elaboration on what specifically he does, but let me go ahead and read his bio for you all, and then he can come up. We'll, we'll give him a warm welcome after I finish reading. Richard, also going by Dick Taylor, has been a pastor in the Bible Fellowship Church since 1973. He spent most of his pastoral ministry at Grace Bible Fellowship Church in Wallingford, PA. Since retiring from the full-time pastorate, he has been a mentoring assistant to the church planters. He is also the chairman of the Board of Church Extension. Dick Taylor attended Arsenius College, Westminster Theological Seminary, and Biblical Theological Seminary, now Michio Seminary. Dick and his wife, Joyce, live in Chester County, PA, and have six grown children and many grandchildren. As he makes his way up to the stage, let's go ahead and give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Lee. <clears throat> when they read the bio, you say, is, is that me? <laughs> uh, before I read the scripture, let me do a, a brief commercial. I, I do uh, work with our church planting uh, ministry. And we try, we're trying to get the word out. It's, it's like uh, people aren't getting it. We have tremendous things. Last year, uh, three new churches came into the denomination through it. Uh, we're expecting two more this year. We just started one in Elkton, uh, Maryland, and uh, are looking to looking to start one in Selbyville, Delaware. Uh, our our big problem is facilities. Four of our churches are have grown to the point where they can't, and it's very difficult to get facilities. Uh, you, you, real estate is expensive. Just to go out and build, you're talking millions of dollars, uh, rentals or so on. So anyway, uh, uh, I'd like you to be aware of that. I'd like you to follow that if you're not connected. Uh, you can go to, the, to our website, to the, to the Bible Fellowship website, bfc.org. And, uh, you know, you can see the various ministries there and uh, get, get connected to, to them. And uh, anyway, uh, I'm excited about what's happening in uh, Jesus said, I will build my church, and uh, we're, we're part of that, and uh, God is using the Bible Fellowship Church in that way. I want to read from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Um, I recently 
read a book, and it began with a question. How did we get to the place where we understand when someone says, I am a woman in a man's body? Uh, how do we get there? You know, uh, imagine asking that question 30 years ago. Are, are you crazy? Uh, how did we get to the point where, where okay, we know what they're talking about. Uh, you, you don't agree with it, but you, you know what they're talking about, okay? You are aware of how our culture is changing. You are aware of that, and it's becoming increasingly, unfortunately, intolerant of people who hold biblical views and values, increasingly intolerant. So who are you to condemn those who want to change their gender identity? How can you say a person doesn't have the right to choose who they want to be? How can you say that? How can you say that abortion is wrong? What gives you the right to say that a woman, uh, to deny a woman's control of her body? What gives you that right? Why would you suggest that marriage between two people of the same sex is a problem? What, what, do you have a problem with two people wanting to be happy? That's all they want. They just want to be happy. So who are you to deny that? With these changes comes the sense that followers of Jesus who believe what the Bible says are actually enemies. They're impose, imposing their moral standards on us. They're enemies of the good, uh, that the society of what our culture says is good. God was giving direction to uh, the people of Peter's day. Uh, we think we're the first people that ever face these kinds of circumstances, but the fact is the people and the culture in Peter's day was very much like what we're facing today. All kinds of strange things. They had to be dealt with. God was giving them direction how to negotiate those confusing and difficult circumstances and questions and issues, God was giving direction. So in the passage that I just read, uh, I think there are three takeaways, and let me share them with you. And you take them, think about them, do something with them. First, regard Christ as holy. Regard Christ as holy. Now, literally it says, make Christ holy. But we can't make Christ holy because, well, he already is holy. How can we make him holy? He is holy. He was holy before we did anything. Now, our normal use of the word holy means morally pure. That's the way we use it normally. When we call someone holy, we are suggesting that they are moral, that they are upstanding, that they are upright, that they're good people. That's what we say when, when we call a person holy. But, but holy can mean set apart in a special way. Holy can mean something more than just morally pure. It can mean set apart. To make Christ holy is to give him a special place in your life. To make someone holy is to give them a special place. They stand out. They're, they're unique. They're special. To make Christ holy is to give him a special place in your life. When you make him holy, you exalt him. You lift him up. You say how great he is. You exalt him. You make him special. When you make him holy, you make him the most important factor in determining what you are and who you are in life. Making Christ holy means that's what you're doing. He is the most important person in your life. He, he, he controls who you are. He controls who you, what you think. And you want him to do that. So you understand when you make Christ holy that Jesus is Lord. Now, you can't live in this world and not feel the pressures to conform to it and to its values and activities. Uh, you, you just... You, you, can't, you can't miss that. When you watch TV commercials, and, uh, you know, uh, I suppose most of us watch TV and the commercials go by, we pay attention to them. 
You feel drawn to spending your days doing what the commercials tell you to do, lounging on a beach somewhere. Uh, that's the life you ought to be living. That's what you ought to be doing. Uh, lounging on a beach or driving the latest car. These are the sorts of things that, that advertisements are telling us. You ought to, you ought to have that. You ought, that ought to be in your life. Commercials not only sell a product, they sell a way of thinking. You should be happy. That's one of the messages we hear again and again and again. You should be happy. This product, whatever it is, whether you're on the beach, whether you're driving the latest car, whether you're going to the most fashionable place, uh, this will make you happy. That's why you need to buy. That's not why you need what's there. So it's easy to start thinking that the life that is presented through commercials we watch is the real life. That if you don't have what the commercial is selling, you're missing out on life. You're missing out on it. It is easy to start thinking that way. Uh, if you are not happy, life is passing you by. Life is passing you by, and you don't want to miss out on that, do you? If life is, if you're not happy, you're going to miss out, okay? Then you remember that Jesus is to be holy. We are to make him holy. That is, we are to put his desires, what he teaches, above what we're seeing in those commercials, above what we're seeing and believing we ought to have. Above those things, if you feel the tension of resisting the voices of the secular culture, you are normal. That's what happens. When you look to Jesus and make him holy, you feel a kind of tension. You, don't, you, you know you don't quite belong in this culture. You don't quite belong to what is going on here. The values and agenda of the holy Jesus must come first and foremost in your life. They must be first and foremost. So as you look out, make Christ holy. If you are to survive all of this chaos, you must be clear about that. Uh, you can't fudge. You can't hesitate. You can't be halfway. You have to be clear that Jesus comes first. What he desires, what he wants. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know it's not easy, but that's the way... That's what we're to do. That's what we're to think about. As you negotiate the craziness of what's going on around us, the craziness of the way people are thinking, the craziness of what people are doing, you must keep your eyes on Jesus and desire what he desires. So that's what Peter says. And again, it wasn't different for them. It was a culture that was, was, uh, was not interested uh, it was a culture that viewed Christians as enemies. It was a culture that viewed Christians as crazy. We often hear that we are to be in the world, but not of it. We can say that, and again, I'm sure that you struggle with that. I know I do. I'm surrounded by these things that call for my attention, that call for my allegiance, that call for it. So... Peter begins by this, giving it this takeaway. Make Christ holy. Make Christ holy. That is, make him the most important factor in your life, the most important factor of your decision making, the most important factor of what you desire. Make Christ holy. That's the first takeaway. The second one, prepare to make a defense for the hope that is in you. Now, we hear the word hope. Many people understand the word hope to mean wishful thinking. I hope I can do this, or I hope I can do that. In other words, I'm thinking wishfully about something I want to do, and uh, so that comes out in the word hope. When God speaks about hope, he is talking about a confident expectation. There's nothing uncertain about hope when the Bible uses the word hope. There's nothing uncertain about that. We're focused on hope when we think of God's kingdom. We know that's coming. That is our hope. The, the, the Bible calls it the blessed hope, okay? It's focused on his kingdom. 
in, his ca in that case, hope is what you expect. You know that Jesus is coming. You know that you can expect him. You know that you will be in his presence. And you know that you want to please him. That's hope. Hope is rooted in your connection to Jesus. And let me be clear. Uh, if you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, you don't have that connection. And I want to invite you to have him as your hope. That is to trust him. He came here. He died on the cross to set you free from your sins, to set you free from death, to give you hope. You need to have that hope. So if you're here today and you have not trusted Jesus, let me encourage you. I'll be glad to talk to you. There are any number of people that would begin to talk to you. That's why the first takeaway is to make Christ holy. That's the important thing. That's where we start. You will be trying to work through the complications of living with people who think you are crazy or even an enemy. Uh, people that you, you work with, people in your neighborhood, that don't know Jesus, again, they, they, they don't know what to do with you. They don't know why you think the way you think. They don't know why you do the things that you do. They, they, they think you're crazy. And some of them think you're an enemy. You're trying to destroy my way of life. That's what some think. You need to be rooted in him, and you need to be sure about that. You need to be sure about that. So you must hear his voice above all other voices. And there are lots of voices that are, being, uh, that, that are going through your ears. Lots of voices are going through. You hear many voices. You work hard. You should be free to go whitewater rafting on weekends. Now you've got the real life. That's the, way it, that's the way it is. You ought to be free to do that. Are you not free to do that? Oh, you're missing out. You're missing out. I can see the advertisements geared to re retired folks that uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm aware of them, tell me that I ought to be spending my days on the beach, uh, you know, lounging there, or playing pickleball, okay? Uh, one, one of those things. It's just, it's kind of, I notice the retired commercials and uh, uh, the, the lifestyle that they're promoting for people who are retired. And uh, I, when, I, when I talk to somebody that's retired, I, I, I often remind them, I say, the only unhappy retirees I know are those who retired because they didn't want to do anything, okay? The happy retirees are doing something. You must hear his voice above all others. So you have to keep asking the question, what does Jesus expect of me? What does he want of me? So be prepared to explain why you put your hope in Jesus and what Jesus wants. Be prepared to explain. This kind of thing, this hope, is something that our secular world just doesn't get. I mean, if you have this conversation with somebody that is, uh, you know, a, a friend or a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus, they think you're strange. Uh, they think you're weird. Uh, uh, they, they think that that you've missed something. Recently, you have been hearing about how depression, loneliness, and hopelessness have become epidemic. Uh, this is not just recent. This is coming about. Uh, it, it, it began, I, you know, every, everything changed when we had that, that COVID thing. Uh, you know, that's behind us. But it has changed us. It has changed what we think about. It has changed what we do. Those who, those who, uh, uh, those who, who, who left that, the, the, the depression, and uh, what we hear about today is the depression in teenagers. Uh, they're, they're online. Uh, they're uh, connected by uh, electronics uh, and so on. But it's just fascinating that we're hearing about depression, increased rates of suicide. Uh, it's sad because they don't have an idea. For older folks, we struggle with the lack of purpose. What, what, what are we supposed to do with our lives? Uh, I, I, I still try to walk every day, and I, I, walk, I, I walk by a guy. I don't know. Maybe I should stop to talk to him, but I see him sitting on his, in the front of his house in a chair, 
doing nothing. I go, ah, oh, that's not the life I would want. And I, I can't imagine how, how it can be that he just sits there and does nothing. And I often see him there, so it's not a, it's, it, it's not a, a new thing. When, like I said, the, pandem the pandemic opened a box, which, while that's past, it opened a box that is still open. And some of the things that were, were, were undone through the epidemic are still with us and still causing us to struggle, still causing us to struggle. When these conversations come to you, you can explain why you have hope. There will be people, again, they will say, I, I, don't, I don't understand. You can explain. You understand that God created you. You are not a mistake. You are not a, 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 a chance event. God created you. You know that. He made you for his purposes. So if you're going to be what he wants you to be, you're going to understand that you were made by God for him, for his purposes. So what gives your hope is your re living, resurrected Savior, knowing that he is with you, knowing that he has made you, knowing that he wants to use you. That's what gives hope. He created you. He made you for his purposes. You're not here just to, to do whatever. You're here to do what God wants you to do. And that's a marvelous and wonderful thing. You're not just floating and drifting on through life. When you are seeking to do and be what God desires, you live in hope. And you can give an answer. You have hope. You have hope for what he wants you to be. You, are not, you don't need to live in despair. If you are in despair, you have to remember, God made you. God made you. And he has plans and a purpose for you. When you are seeking to be and do what he desires, you live in hope, not with despair. You live in hope. You are not crazy when you live in hope, but you're living God's good life. God's good life says, I know why I'm here. I know how God wants to use me. I know how God wants to use my contacts with people. That's hope. You know that sort of thing. You are living out of your hope. You may refuse to have what people call the good life, but you have God's good life. That's called hope. That's called hope. Hope based on your desire to serve the Lord is what shapes your life. So you're not just drifting along. You're not just drifting along. Uh, I, I am retired. There are these days where I wake up and I go, what am I going to do now? But I know that there is something that God wants me to do. And I go try to find that. I go try to find that. So uh, we are to be prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in you. And if you know Jesus, there is hope within you. There is hope within you. Now, the third takeaway is you need to respond to their questions with gentleness and respect. Uh, we live in a very divisive uh, and, and uh, strongly divisive uh, culture right strongly divisive. Many are writing about how divided we are, how divisive we have become. The, the news of political interaction is just a symptom. We all saw the, 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 the level to which political division can go last night as we saw our, our, one of our presidential candidates, uh, the, the, the victim of an attempt on his life. How did we get to that point? How do, we get, how do we get that divisive? I confess I try to avoid political discussion. If, if, if you're in there and a the political discussion comes up, you know you're going to get it. Uh, you, you, whatever you say, if someone is coming from the other side, they're going to attack you. They're not going to dialogue with you. They're going to attack you and look at you like you're an enemy. The ideas you have are destructive. Wait. The ideas I have are not destructive, okay? So it is not about dialogue and finding points, uh, points of, of, dis of agreement. Uh, that's, uh, by the way, that's what politics is supposed to be about. People are going to disagree, so they look for points of agreement. That's what our leaders in Washington are supposed to do. That's not what they're doing. They're fighting with each other. 
And that doesn't help us to, to, to get to be where God wants us to be. You won't find many positive conversations in a situation like that. And uh, again, if, you've, uh, uh, if you're like me and uh, ducking political conversations, <laughs> you probably have the same reason. I know that if we start the co political conversation, it's going to be an argument. And I try to avoid that. I, let's just talk. Let's share our points of view. Let's share our points of view. Okay. So when you talk like this, when you talk like, uh, you won't find many positive conversations. When you suggest that salvation is possible only through trusting in Jesus, you are being intolerant. You are being intolerant. You're telling people, you're telling everybody else that they are wrong. That's, that's how people take it when you share the gospel. You're telling them that they're wrong. So when you talk like this, the, the, the secular mind says, you're arrogant. You're arrogant because you're saying you're right. You're saying you're right and, and uh, that I'm wrong. And you're thinking that your truth is the only truth. That's the kind of conversation that goes on. And it doesn't usually go in a positive direction. So be prepared to share your hope with gentleness and respect, what Peter says. Now again, remember that his world was very much like ours. And Christians were viewed as enemies. They were called atheists. They, you know, it, it, that was the world he lived. Arguing, arguing and raised voice conversations are not helpful. They are not helpful. Uh, you are just becoming part of the conversation. Uh, having those raised voice conversations uh, just doesn't help. We recall that God said a soft answer turns away wrath. That's, a, that's a, a, a truth that we need to hold on to, a soft answer. So that's why, that is why Peter says, be identified with gentleness and respect. Now, one good way to do that is to become a listener. How good a listener are you? When you're having one of those conversations, okay, are you trying to think about how you're going to respond or are you thinking about what the person says? Okay, are you thinking about that? Be identified with gentleness and respect. One good way is to become a listener. One good way is to become a listener. Uh, listening communicates respect. If you come to talk to me and I'm looking away and looking at something else, or if I'm trying to think about how I'm going to respond to you, you're going to see that. But when I'm listening to you, I'm paying attention to you. I'm listening to you. Even when you are listening to what is wrong, and you know that what people are telling you is wrong, even when, you're doing, when you know they're wrong, listening communicates respect. Listening begins building a relational bridge. A relational bridge. If you listen to someone, they're going to listen to you. I'm going to just give it a second here till they can help. Our, our attention is over there. I had, I know this is awkward, but I know your attention is over there and there's people, there's people helping. Uh, I, I was one time preaching in uh, the uh, Scranton church. This is a lot of years ago and, and a lady over here start, starts to, to crumple and uh, uh, everybody's, everybody's watching her and a couple guys come forward and take her out and they said, oh, this happens all the time. <laughs> And of course, it, it it was it was it was unnerving uh, unnerving to uh, to me. So we were at this point. Listening communicates respect. If I listen to what you say, I care about you, even if I think you are wrong. Even if I think you are wrong, if I listen to you and understand where you're coming from, 
I can interact with you. At some point, when you are listening, God may open the ears of the person you are listening to and cause them to see how Jesus can save you. In other words, if you listen to them, they're more apt to listen to you. So he says, be prepared to give an answer for the hope. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, gentleness and respect doesn't seem to characterize the dialogue that we have with people today about these significant issues. Some will not listen to you regardless of how respectful you try to be, regardless of how gentle you respond. Some will not listen to you. Sadly, they will walk away and not listen. They will walk away and not listen. You can never be sure, though, that what you say isn't, hasn't been heard. You can never be sure. And sometimes it comes back. Sometimes it comes back. If they will listen because you listened, you may say something that will lead them to trust in Jesus. So Peter says to the Holy Spirit, be prepared to give the answer, but do it with gentleness and reverence and respect. Do it with that in mind, and so on. So, again, Peter, living in a world like ours, what he says is, hope has answers. And if you know Jesus, you have hope. You're looking around at a, a world in chaos, our current situation is not all doom and gloom, though. It's not all doom and gloom. The Lord God is still sovereign. The Lord God is still at work. The Lord God is still using people. It's not all that bad. God is the sovereign ruler. He is able to open the hearts of people around you, even the one who argues most strongly with you. God is able to open the hearts. It isn't your arguing that, uh, that, that wins them. It is the work of the Holy Spirit through what you are saying that brings them to trust in him. God is able to open the hearts around you to the truth of salvation. And you'd like that. God will do that. Be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. Let's pray. Father, we are living in difficult, difficult times uh, this isn't a new thing. Uh, our country has been divided before. Our country has had uh, people arguing with each other. It's almost more the, the commonplace. Help us, Lord, to negotiate these, these troubling times. And help us to be those people that are able to answer with gentleness and reverence. And lead people to see the glory of Jesus through what we say. I pray that you will help us continue to use us in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close in response with the um, modern version of the hymn, Give Me Jesus. So if you're able, please stand and uh, let's echo that message and remind ourselves that apart from Jesus, we are incapable of any of those responses, interactions for his glory.
Lord, go with us. We need you. We live in a, in, in a divided, difficult world, a world that rejects. So our prayer is that you will use us and allow people to see in us the glorified Savior and the life that he gives. And give us hope through it, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.